Welcome to My Therapist Says, an interactive experiencing enriching your most important relationships. During today's event, I'll be your host and moderator as we present Telling Yourself the Truth. Most of what happens is because of what you believe. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 instructs finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Today I'm joined by Ms. Yolanda Gorick and Dr. Julie Hayden, both of whom are licensed psychotherapists. Yolanda is my colleague at the Center for Enriching Relationships and Dr. Hayden, a licensed psych psychiatrist, psychologist, excuse me, is the Dean of the Graduate School of Behavioral Sciences at Southern California Seminary. For over 10 years, Ms. Gore presented today's topic by invitation of Reverend Jack Hayford and the Church on the Way in San Fernando, California. An expert in this area and a radio personality, Yolanda is currently a sought after professional. I frequently ask my university students, what do you believe? At first, this sounds like a simple question, at least until you realize that what you believe is important. It can take you further than you want to go. Take, for instance, the belief that a zygote is only random cells and not an actual human being. That belief will unfortunately lead you into supporting abortion. Or let's say you believe that blue-eyed human beings are better than brown-eyed. Unfortunately for those, having this belief has supported unimaginable atrocities against human race. And let's say you believe you're unlovable. If this is your belief, then it may be difficult for you in absorbing God's magnificent grace. What you and I believe is incredibly important. Ms. Gorick and Dr. Hayden will now lead us into a biblical understanding of how important your beliefs are while providing you with skills for improving your beliefs, resulting in a better mental and spiritual health. Today's event takes place before a live audience and live streaming while offering practical biblical solutions. It's like having your own Christian mental health provider within the comforts of your living room. I hope you will sit back, relax, and take in these life-changing insights. Please join me as we now connect with a live audience and My Therapist Says. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics, and you might find some surprising details tonight, but I'm praying that if there's any misbelief that you're currently protecting, that you would surrender it and give it up to the Lord tonight. So uh, the scripture I started out, I'm starting out with is one that's familiar to everyone here. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity. When you read that, you probably don't think that you're the one arguing with God, do you? You probably think your imagination is right on track with where God wants it to be. But if you ever had a negative self-thought about yourself, about God, or someone else, then you are living in a stronghold. A stronghold definition might surprise you. It is an area where most people have the same beliefs and the values, and it's also a place of security or survival. So I want to broaden this and keep it in this context so you'll want to figure out, well, why is it so important I tell myself the truth? The misbelief theory is a, a theory that is very common for uh, my, my therapy because it deals with how people think. It starts out with an event, the meaning that we make of an event, or it could be a life experience. It can create a negative self-talk about yourself. What do you say to yourself when something goes wrong in your life? What do you say to yourself? It can cause you to think something bad about yourself, something bad about others, your future, and God. I wouldn't say that it's wrong not to think bad things about yourself, but many times 
it digs us a hole where we become entrenched in a thought about ourselves that doesn't match up with the Word of God. It can cause us anxiety, depression, real, really unhappiness, and we can also blame God for our unhappiness. And that's the part where I want you to get a new perspective. You may feel, well, what does it matter? Maybe God really thinks I'm a loser. What if he thinks I failed him? Many Christians I listen to think they, they disappointed God. And so he doesn't really care about them. That's where I want you to perk up and listen to this uh, talk tonight and ask questions. Sometimes when we're depressed or anxious, we start to feel like, well, we need comfort. And if we think God is blaming us or punishing us, we're not going to go to God. Let's go to an addiction, either a behavioral or a substance. An addiction can be a behavioral addiction would be gambling, pornography, affairs, shopping, working, codependency, and control. Some of you might feel like you need to keep things under control, but... If it's not under God's control, it's under your control. And that doesn't mean that you'll find happiness. And it doesn't mean that you will understand how God loves you and thinks about you. He has a plan for you. So this is the general idea for the misbelief theory. And I've highlighted the meaning you make to an event. What do you tell yourself when something goes wrong? It's my fault. I should have known better. Uh, I should never have tried this. What a fool I am. I'm never going to do this again. The origin of a stronghold, which is another word for a misbelief, goes something like this. You have a blank space on your paper so that you can create whatever event you can think of where you were really hard on yourself. So the, whatever the event you want to think of, and the meaning could be, if I don't please everyone, then I'm not a good Christian. And I left those with a line in there because it could be anyone. If I can't please my husband, if I don't please my wife, if I can't please my family, then I'm not a good wife, a good husband. I'm not a good daughter. I'm not a good daughter-in-law. I'm not a good Christian. If I'm not good, then I won't be valuable or needed. If I'm not valuable, they'll replace me. I'm not indispensable. If they replace me, I'm not important, I don't really matter, then I'll grow old and be lonely and no one will love me. So it kind of runs into this spiral. I'll be tossed aside, I'll be replaced. Remember the definition of a stronghold is a place of security or survival. And many times we're not aware that the thoughts we think are the things we, have to, we believe we have to think about ourselves because we believe it's the truth. And it keeps us going. The origin of a stronghold can come from a lot of places, and I'll go into that later. But I want you to think that it's not so important where it comes from, is what you do when you find it, when you discover it. When God points a finger and says, you know, you've been really hard on yourself after all these years. It's not me telling you that you're a failure, that you're a loser. You could feel... Anxious, depressed, hurt, and resentful. It takes a lot of work to please everybody. And then they're not really pleased with you. So you could begin to be very resentful and angry at God. Because you, if you think that God wants you to please other people, to be a good Christian, then you could get really angry with God too. You could uh, be codependent, needing approval from others. You'd have difficulty saying, no, I can't do that right now. Uh, you'd also have a low immune system, and your identity would be a people pleaser following this example. Sometimes a misbelief becomes so entrenched in our mind, remember it's a stronghold, that we read scripture and we convince ourselves that this is really what God wants us to do. I've heard many Christians say, you know what, I'm doing a lot, I'm multitasking, I'm working two jobs, but I can do all things in Christ. And the question is, but your family doesn't see you, and your health is run down, and you've been to the hospital. How do you think that God is, in, is encouraging you to do this? No, it's not uncommon for us to twist the Scripture when we're living with a misbelief. 
See, I know someone who convinced herself that she should divorce her second husband because he was not saved. And she thought, well, the Bible says you shouldn't be unequally yoked. Unfortunately, or fortunately, God confronted me at the moment when I wanted to divorce my husband, my second husband, and he said, no, this is your idea. This isn't my idea. I have a plan for both of you, and it's for good, not for evil. So it's not uncommon for us to have a twisted view of Scripture if we're living under a misbelief, and it's someplace that we want to convince ourselves this is our way, and it's the right way. Telling yourself the truth, here's what it does. Many people say, well, what difference does it make? Here's one thing. Telling yourself the truth happens in layers. So it's not just one truth, because if you've been holding on to this lie, that's what I call a misbelief, it's had a lot of time to gather a lot of strength. Remember, it's a stronghold. It's something you protect at all costs. So the truth would be, it's impossible for me to please everyone. Some would say, well, it's impossible for me to please my husband anyway. The truth is, it's unnecessary to please everyone. The next truth layer might be, God isn't asking me to please anyone but him. Another truth might be, you know what? I'm not indispensable. Somebody else could do what I'm doing. I put the truth in capital letters because it's from Scripture. And all the personal truths that you, you uncover as you're learning about what are the misbeliefs, the solid truth that you come to, that you line up every thought that you have, is scripture. Galatians 1.10 says, For now, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. There you go. You're not twisting scripture to satisfy your need to be important or to be needed so you'll have friends. You have the word of God saying, I'm not asking you to do that, so you can quit blaming me for all the work that you're doing. It wasn't my idea in the first place. Hmm. Okay, the next slide is, where do misbeliefs come from? I've given you three places where I see a lot of misbeliefs come from. Childhood, culture, change. Misbeliefs that come from childhood. We are adults and we, as scripture has said in 2 Corinthians, I once was a child, I thought as a child, and I behaved like a child, but now I'm an adult. Many of us are adults and are physical and emotional, but we carry a part inside that we believe is uh, from our childhood. For example, I'm just going to get one of these. Uh, there are four roles that we might take up as a child in a dysfunctional family. We do this to survive to feel loved, to feel accepted, and sometimes, in some cases, just to survive so we're not injured or hurt. The last one, I've, they've got four. One is the hero, the scapegoat, the mascot, and the lost child. And many Christians blame God for feeling disconnected, for not feeling loved or accepted. The lost child is one that is very common that I hear from Christians they feel that no one cares about them, and they feel invisible, invisible in church, whether the church is big, like this one, or small. They feel no one cares, and they're, they fly beneath the radar. It might be because a parent said, you know, I'm so glad you don't need me because you don't cause any problems. You're just fine by yourself. So the child who feels like a lost child will hide their feelings because no one's listening, and besides that, if somebody heard their feelings, they might get angry or upset. So they just step back and they create their own world. That's one example. Misbeliefs of culture. We're all born into a culture. But the most important one, there's two. The culture of our parents. We don't choose the parents that we, the family that we're born into. But I believe that many of us are, we inherit the values of our parents. And that could be good or bad, but we hold on to them like a stronghold because we believe that's what makes us right, that's what makes us good. 
some of the values could be work valued over family. Maybe you came from a family where your father worked two or three jobs. You didn't see him, but he provided. Maybe the culture that your parents were born in were uh, the values where women are caregivers. Maybe family was valued over self-care. So as an adult, you are a huge, major player as a caregiver. You do everything to take care of your children, your husband, but you let yourself go. Maybe as a husband, you feel that if you work 50, 60 hours a week, you're doing what a husband should do because that's what your dad did. You didn't see him very much, but by golly, you're going to be a good dad. The other culture that is very important and can shape your misbelief about yourself is the one that you grew up in as an adolescent. Many times as an adolescent, it's a time of challenge. It's a time of change and taking risks because you're pulling away from your parents and saying, I'm not like my dad. I'm not like my mom. I'm me. And sometimes that rebellion is just trying to figure out who you are. So for myself in the 60s and 70s, I rebelled against tradition, especially traditional religion. And so I had a long time searching for God because I thought for sure he'd never be in a building. And I was positive that he would never be in something as established as a book. He had to be out there somewhere because all of us during that generation were pretty much out there. <laughs> I probably still am out there. <laughs> Last one, misbeliefs of change. I use change to help you understand that change can be a loss, a hurt, or a disappointment. And many times Christians are uncomfortable with sharing with anyone that you have a problem. You're disappointed or you're hurt. Maybe they'll judge you and say, you didn't pray hard enough, you didn't ask enough help, you need Jesus, you need to fast, you need to do all these things. So we hide those feelings of hurt. Sometimes it gets us into trouble, and it creates a misbelief, and we kind of become a stronghold to ourselves, and we don't let anyone in. Some of the thoughts that we can think are, I can't protect myself, I'm a failure, if you had any kind of abuse, you might think, I am permanently damaged. So from now on, nothing good is going to happen to me. You might also think about God. God doesn't really care. He can't protect me. A lot of Christians surprisingly feel that if things don't turn around quickly or if they get worse, that God is punishing them. But nothing could be farther from the truth. The last one, I just can't trust anyone. I'm on my own. There is a stronghold that is really hard to break. And remember, the definition of a stronghold is some place where you feel safe and secure. If you can't trust anyone, then you're going to stay to yourself. So how do you pull down these th strongholds anyway? They seem pretty intimidating. So here's a couple of points. The first one is obvious. Admit your pain. I hurt. Instead of telling someone, I'm fine, really, I'm okay, I'm not fine, I need help, be accountable to someone who will tell you the truth, not just someone who loves you so much that they will not confront you when there's something going wrong, and you need an honest answer. I need help to get back on track. Be accountable with a person that is hungry after God and is not going to hide the truth from you. The next one, confront your beliefs with God's word. Do you really think God's punishing you for something because your life just hasn't been perfect? The truth is God has a plan for your life. It's good. It's not evil. So compare your beliefs with scripture. The next one, develop realistic expectations of yourself and of other people. If I say no, not everyone is going to be happy. That's true. But it's okay. It's, it's okay. It takes time to learn these. But if you don't quit and give up, your strongholds will come down one by one. The last one I put was examine your thoughts. You might think it's strange if I say, well, who's talking to you in your head? When clients come in and they tell me, you know, I was thinking that God is trying to teach me a lesson, and that's why my foot broke when I fell off the stairs. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, what? Who do you think would tell you that? 
you to be able to break the strongholds and tell yourself the truth and leave your misbeliefs behind and become more intimate and trusting with God, you will have to challenge and examine the thoughts that go through your head, the ticker tape that you accept so willingly, especially when it's bashing you, accusing you, or condemning you. It's a time to wake up. And telling yourself the truth will take you into a new life and a new experience of knowing God for who he really is, and he'll introduce you to the real you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda, very succinct, and I hope that you've taken time to carefully look at the uh, handout that you have. She had much more information there. She actually did a sterling process of connecting us with the handout and then uh, the PowerPoint and helping us to lead into some wonderful concepts. I want to go back to that stronghold, that, that idea, because all three of us see this in our practices and in your teaching, I know, Dr. Hayden, stronghold is you, you said to protect at all cost. I want to, I want to un, unlayer that for just a moment. Um, when we were talking about the different strongholds and things that we can protect, um, can we talk about some of those specifics that you've seen, strongholds that people you've seen in your practices, um, and, and what, what has happened to them to get them there? To kind of, if we can, give some flesh to uh, the concepts that have been shared can you think of situations where people have done this? Could you help us that? I know each of you has several probably, but... Um. I'll tell you one thing that helps people break out of a stronghold, whether they like it or not, is pain. Yes. When they hurt, they're, they really seek help. Maybe not the first time, maybe not the second time. Uh, I was thinking of... Uh, sometimes we're not always aware of the thoughts that we think and how much trouble they're causing us because they seem so normal. They seem so... Right. I remember the uh, husband who came in and said that he was so unhappy with his second wife because he was giving her everything she could possibly want, but she wasn't happy. And I said, well, what does she want? He said, she wants more of me, but that means I can't work as much and give her all the things that she, that <laughs> I want to. And I said, well, so she wants you and not what you can give her, like all of these things? And he said, yes. He said, I I'm ready to divorce her because this is my second time that I've got a wife and they're not happy with me. And he said, you know, if a man cannot please his wife, you know, there's something wrong. A yeah, happy, happy wife is a happy life, they say. So. Yes. yes. So it was a big stronghold. And he said his father had always provided. Hmm. So he believed that if he did that, his wife would be happy. So he didn't understand his wife. So that was a stronghold. And he was in a lot of pain. And he, he just thought, I need another wife, someone who's going to be happy with everything I can give her. So simply said, you're saying a stronghold could be my inability to actually listen to my wife, to actively listen and understand what she's saying, and that that could be a stronghold that I'm seeing through the lens of my own family at times. I think that's what you're suggesting. Is that correct? Okay. Do you have others like this? You know, I'm thinking when you say stronghold, as a place of security, when you have your stronghold in Christ, then that's going to be the result you need that your life will be better because of that. The problem is when the stronghold is in something else. Yes. And what we see is a stronghold in something unhealthy. And it doesn't make logical sense sometimes, but we're stuck. And that reminds me of situations like domestic violence mm. would be an example of a stronghold where you're in a relationship and you convince yourself you need to stay for mm. some reason. And so the truth would be it might be an unhealthy relationship and there should be a way out, you know, to be safe, possibly even for your children, but you remain. And just thinking about the power of the thoughts and the power of homeostasis where you'd rather be comfortable, you be in the situation that you have dealt with than to deal with something else. And the fear that would be that would come if you're not in that safe place that you're comfortable and used to. Uh, that, that's something that comes to my mind with the stronghold that we can't seem to get out of. So the stronghold could even be something very negative because mm -hmm. you were talking about, it, it's very true, isn't it? You may have the stats for particularly women in a, an abusive relationship. They tend to stay in the relationship rather than exit. And part of it can be that it may feel 
normal mm -hmm. to be in it, even though it's very abnormal and dangerous, life-threatening. Right. So what you're saying, so we can we can have these beliefs that you were talking about, Yolanda, that that we, we have a belief and it could be incorrect if, Dr. Hayden, we're not listening to the Word of God. When Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, I kind of overuse mm -hmm. this illustration, but it's like a sandwich. The meat in the middle is really important and truth is right in the middle. I'm the way, Jesus said, the truth and the life. So we're, we're, we are humans that are seeking truth. That's why mm -hmm. we seek the Lord even. So starting with the Lord's truth and not just seeing it through our own lens like this, this man looked through his own lens mm -hmm. and thought just working hard and providing through objects and things would bring happiness to his wife when actually she just really wanted him. I'll tell you something that is kind of a secret uh, among Christians, I think. It's a secret thought. That's another way to determine a, mis a, uh, a misbelief. Is it, is it a secret? Mm. Many times women that I... I see will say, you know, there's a part of me that feels like I deserve this, so I can't leave this relationship. So why do you deserve that? Because I've done something bad, and I think God is punishing me. That is a secret that many Christians hold, and I say it's a secret because it's not something that people often talk about, but sometimes the things that we go through or endure, we're almost a martyr. We feel like we're doing penance. I know this is backwards, mm -hmm. but in our mind, if we're not comfortable sharing with a trusted person what you really are thinking, you won't be able to escape the stronghold that you think is keeping you right with God because it's really crazy making for you to feel that you're going to pay back or earn your righteousness, mm -hmm. or that God is even requiring that of you because you've done something bad. These are the things that I think keep us trapped in strongholds and misbeliefs, that we keep everything close to the vest and we don't tell anyone. If you told anyone that you could trust these mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. I think it would be the beginning of opening up to God as well as Hearing, your, hearing someone else repeat back to you what you just said. That, I think, is probably one of the biggest breakthroughs. Because to hear someone repeat what you think God believes about you and is upside down is a great um, eye-opener. It could be a turning point. On the other hand, if someone does... Uh, feel like they have the courage to express something to you and you think, oh my goodness, this is crazy, for you to hear them without judgment mm -hmm. and be patient mm -hmm. without a reaction and allow them to pour out this idea, this misbelief, was probably the greatest gift anyone could give anyone. Yeah, we see it all the time, don't we, in, in therapy session, uh, the non-judgmental um, uh, way in which you approach, really working at being non-judgmental really just trying to actively listen, it gives the freedom because most of us, I, I don't say all of us, but most of us are in some type of relationship, maybe not your family, but type of relationship where we may be continuously judged on our performance, critiqued, uh, you know, evaluation once a year or more in our work environments. And so we're used to being critiqued and judged not loved in an agape love. That's why I think when Jesus said, I, I had someone today in my, in, in my office who said, I really believe that God is uh, punishing me. He's punishing me for this. And I was really trying to listen to the person. And as we began to unravel and look at it, um, it, it doesn't say that in the Scripture. Actually, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. He's working 24-7 to provide for us and help us. It could be our belief that's leading us into that and maybe our belief that leads us into making decisions that feel punitive because of our own actions. I think it drives me as a Christian to say, how can I listen to the Lord more fully? What can I do to, to kind of declutter my life to have more opportunities to listen to what He has to say? Let me, if I may, move right into some of our questions. We have several and several just came up. Um, what's the best way, the best way to conquer fear? And then the person added the fear of taking a risk. What is the best way, what's the best way to conquer fear, the fear of taking a risk? How would you respond to that? 
you know, I, this is not so specific, but it did make a huge difference in my life. And it was a time I realized that there's much more describing in Scripture of how much God loves faith mm -hmm. compared to righteousness. And obviously that we want righteousness with God, but he says our righteousness is as filthy rags. And as Christians, I think we it's easy for us to think, am I doing what God wants me to do? Am I doing something right? And he would rather have us do something out of faith. It's his favorite thing when we have faith. So for me to enter into being brave and to um, conquer fear, I would consistently remind myself that God is happy and loves everything I'm doing, no matter if I'm succeeding or not, if I'm doing it in faith and trusting him with that. So that gave me a push to be brave. Mm -hmm. What was that question again? The question the is, is what's the best way to conquer fear, the fear of taking a risk? It depends if you've admitted to yourself that you're afraid. Hmm. I would write out what you're afraid of. And if you're going to risk pride, go and do it. Hmm. Because God is with you when you're going to take off the layers of your false self. And when you're building an authentic self, an authentic relationship with God, he's there with you. But I think admitting what you're afraid of, putting it before God, and admitting, again, bring it up right up to Scripture, and admitting, you know what? God has not given me the spirit of fear. Mm -hmm. So if I have it, it's coming from another place. Mm -hmm. So realize that it will never go away. So what do you want to do about it? You need to see the value in you to say that if it means I've got a risk and I'm going to fail, but I'm going to risk telling the truth, I'm going to do it. So make it purposeful. Make it intentional and realize that whatever it is you're afraid of, God is not making you afraid of it. Why is it so hard for us to admit fear? I know I've, I've been challenged with that over the years because that really is the first thing. We know there's a therapist, that's, that's true, but why, why is it for us as humans that it's difficult to admit um, something? Um, I had to admit something to my family at the dinner table Saturday, and I shared it with my class here on Sunday. And I had to apologize for just a reaction I had. And I had to admit my inability to manage something as best as I would have liked to. And I reacted to one of our children. And I, I had to admit that I was kind of getting ramped up with all the things we were trying to do. Saturdays can be a real uh, busy day in our home. And, and I, I'm wanting all these great things to happen to develop our children. And so why is that difficult? I'm much better at it now than I was, uh, say, 20 or 75 years ago. I was just much better at it now. And why is it that we are troubled with that? Why, do we ch why are we challenged with admitting? Because I think it's an important concept. I think the more you think you have to be perfect, this was my story, the more I thought I had to be perfect and right because I'd made so many mistakes as an adolescent, as a young adult. They haunted me. And until I accepted God's forgiveness and his complete love, I was, I would say, I was darn sure I wasn't going to let you know I was still a failure and still a loser. But when I had that acceptance and I knew that I was forgiven, it was okay for me to admit any time, I'm not perfect, I'm not indispensable. And yes, I made that mistake. So it has to do with really accepting God's amazing grace. Mm -hmm. It's really accepting, knowing deeply of his, his love, his agape love, which is what we should have as little children, which is why you were saying our families can develop uh, difficulties for us, maybe being open and accepting God's grace and his love. And truth, just the, the main principle given tonight is truth. And mm -hmm. so when we are fearing and we can't admit fear, what is the meaning behind it? Right. What are we thinking? It's more than just, you know, the fear. It, mm -hmm. it means we're a failure. It means now we're not going to be considered a good mom or, right. you know, a good wife. There's all these deep meanings underneath it. So to unpack it and see what's really yeah. there and then to call truth to it and yeah. to recognize from Scripture the, the truth in whatever that, that meaning is that you're giving to the fear. Yeah, so it's kind of we're looking for, as humans, this perfect behavior, and the Lord is looking for a perfect heart, a heart yes. that is turned toward Him. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we can make mistakes and still be okay, because you helped us to see where it can go to a very bad place 
um, if we uh, are not able to tell ourselves the truth and then be able to accept that. Mm -hmm. Well, this next question, what's the best way? It's talking about um, this idea of helping my teen who is believing lies. What's the best way to help my teen who is believing lies? And there are many lies out there. Um, like the example was, I can't trust anyone. And that would be a, a, a normal process for a teen because they're thinking more analytically. They've seen too much. You are aware that, that our teens today are, as Tony Campolo once said, they are more sophisticated but less mature because they've been exposed to way too much violence, emotion, issues. And so this would not be unusual for a teenager to say this. So how would you respond to that? What's the best way to help my teen who is believing lies? What a brilliant question. I guess I'd ask you, what, what do you hear God showing you is the best way, number one. And if you haven't asked God, then I would say that would be telling yourself the truth mm. that you haven't asked God. Number two, there's a part as an adolescent where they are developing at an, at an incredible speed um, without, uh, with a strong desire to figure out life themselves without you. So there's usually a it's very common for them to have like a pushback to adults. You really need to know, is, it your, is this something you can trust God with to help your teenager discover the truth? Maybe some of those lies are things he needs to grow through rather than you have to protect them from. I think as parents, sometimes we feel we, we don't want our children to have any pain at all. And they need to grow to know who's who are they going to depend on? So I think you model that um, prayer life. You ask God, he's your kid. Uh, how do you want me to help him understand the truth? Because sometimes the biggest truth a teenager needs is knowing that they're loved, even when mm. they're wrong and they're rebellious. Sometimes that's the truth they need to hear over everything you could tell them. Newspaper articles... Uh, you know, anything you want to tell them, see, this is really wrong. My mother did that with me about smoking pot and, you know, psychedelics, and it didn't work. So I would just say, um, give them the message, the truth that you love them and that they are lovable, no matter what lies they decide. And they'll come back. They'll come home. So asking God and then trusting God. Maybe that's why we have um, children first, little children, and then adolescents. Because early on, we develop our trust in God as we're moving that child into the next development stage. But to ask God and to trust, I, sometimes we invert that, do we not? We'll try to go to resources. Uh, um, I'll try to go to the next best textbook or research that shows how to do this rather than turning, tuning in and turning toward God. So you're saying asking God and then trusting. What a, those are very helpful. Yes. The only thing I'd add is that, you know, they call in Scripture, the Holy Spirit's called the Spirit of Truth. Yes. And so having that relationship with Christ and having the Holy Spirit within the teenager mm -hmm. will go, you know, beyond those years of, of difficulty. Yes. And so I would pray and be active in whatever could be done, you know, to foster a relationship between the teenager and God. Mm -hmm. And that could be modeled through the parental relationship. And I, I like what Yolanda's saying, and, and just to go further, is allowing questioning. I think questioning is a process that the teenager will come out on the other side with answers and beliefs of their own. So do not be afraid of the time when they're questioning, but rather answer on a personal basis. Well, this is what I think about that. This is the conclusion I came to, but not not um, feeling that fear and mm -hmm. shutting down the questions when they start asking. Mm -hmm. So you're really pointing back to how we trust the Lord, how mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit is speaking to us when those difficult questions, like if there are lies coming mm -hmm. down to that child and they're maybe buying into them. And I think I was hearing you say, Julie, I think he was hearing you say that even as we turn, ask like you said, and trust, Yolanda, as we turn to the Lord and we let them know that we've been asking for the Holy Spirit to guide us, yeah. and we believe He's leading us this way. So being very transparent with your own walk with the Lord can be a wonderful example to teenagers and a wonderful example for your mate as well. 
how you're listening to the Lord. So that becomes part of the conversation of any marriage or any parenting. Yes. You know, as we're talking about this, this next question goes into a powerful way that truth can be twisted. This next question asks, what if family members are making you do penance? So, for example, the, the word is emotional ransom. So, somehow they're trying to make you do penance. We were talking about the fact that we're saved by grace through faith. We've not earned it, so we, we're not doing penance, if you will. But the question is, what if the family members are making you do penance? And I'm not sure I understand the full question, but if we could put it in this context, let's suggest that emotional ransom, they, they are somehow treating you unfairly and non-truth. So, non-truth is swirling around, and they're trying to somehow cause you to have pain that really is not yours. How about if we paint the question that way? Do you understand what I'm… I, I just think that's extremely common. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, I'm sure everybody has family members that still hold them, you know, in a a place where they want them to pay for something that just is a part of families. Mm -hmm. But to to be able to have yourself separate from what I, what I would call that as drama, that you are who you are apart from anything that other family member is trying to create you to be in that environment. So to really hold to truth where if they are trying to make you do something or feel a certain way, they don't actually have that ability unless you give it to them. Mm -hmm. So to be kind to answer back, you know, any kind of passive aggressive communication or something like that with just truth. I understand you're still angry, but I am not responsible for that. You know, just saying whatever the truth is in that situation and trying not to be caught up emotionally in what they're pulling you into, but to stand separate from it. And, and that takes work, but it's worth it. And I think that it will increase the drama at first, but eventually I do think the, the boundaries will create a separation where you can be with that family member, but not so involved in, in what they're trying to pull you into. Let's role play that for a minute, okay. shall we? Let's sure. assume I'm, we haven't planned this, but let's assume <laughs> I'm your estranged father. I'm probably old enough to be your, your father. Um, not as bright as you, but, it, it, but all of this, say you're my estranged daughter and, you, and your sister, who's my other uh, child, um, I'm saying that you've been talking bad about me, okay? okay. Let's do that, and let me, let me try to put this on you, and you pay some form of penance here, if I can create a story. I know you do this with your <laughs> students. I do it all the time, so I feel comfortable that we might be able to, to make this happen here. Okay, so I'll say, well, Julie, you know, your, your sister Martha, you know, she was telling me that you were talking trash about me, I mean, talking down, and I mean, I don't appreciate it. I was going to give you the money you know, you needed for your second semester, you know, your postdoctorate work that you're doing, and I was going to give you about 15000 but uh, unless you straighten up and I find that you're, you're, you're not talking trash about me, I'm going to withhold that from you. All right, just real quick, am I get putting penance on you or you're… I'm putting penance on you. Okay. 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 Sorry, I should have set that sure, up. No I problem. thought I was doing so great no, with this you story. Did great. but you did. You know, I'm okay. there. I'm like, <laughs> Dad, I, I'm not sure exactly what she's talking about, but I'm, I'm not trying to talk bad about you to anybody. Uh, I thank you very much for everything you've given me. I appreciate yeah, the Yeah, but money. she told me, she told me the other day that, you know, when you were 10 years old and, and, and she was 12, remember, mm -hmm. and we didn't go to Disneyland and it was because of your, your, your mom that we mm -hmm. had a problem, and that she says, you keep bringing that up from the past and, and putting me down as though I'm this uh, father that just abandons his children. Yeah, I, I was frustrated and was talking with her, but I'm not, I'm not purposely talking about you a lot behind your back. It was that conversation. I don't have anything against you anymore from the past. I'm letting that go, and I really appreciate your help with school. Yeah. Well, how can I accept that what you're telling me is truth? You, you know, Because I'm not sure. I, I have a hard time you. believing it. I have a hard time believing this. I, I don't mind it. If you, if you don't accept it, that's okay. I just want you to know that that's, that's the truth. I, I'm telling you the truth. If you don't accept it, that's okay. Okay. How'd we do? All right. Okay. All right. We should have but thrown Yolanda in. I should have put she, Yolanda. She you were the other sister. Somebody. Yeah, we could Martha. We could have included Martha here. So yeah. what were you doing with me? I was trying to put this off on you yeah. and for you to own it and for me to own nothing. You know, 
something, somebody else told me this, so I can't even take credit for it, but say the truth and nothing else. Mm. I think a lot of times, especially us wonderful passive aggressive communicators, uh, (laughs) we say, oh, sure, no problem. Everything's fine. And then we jab them somehow with extra language. And so to what I, when I'm in that situation, Mm -hmm. I focus on what is the truth. I didn't talk bad about him, then I'm saying that. And I'm not trying to add, she shouldn't have told you, I'm so sick and tired. You know, I'm not trying to add any other information at all, except for if I can identify one truth, and then I just keep repeating it. And it's, it, the power of that drama will lose, you lose, you know, will decrease and decrease to where, what else can he say? Okay, well, how do you then manage your own emotion in that? I, I know this was a mock make-believe, and we just sure. ad-libbed here, but how do you manage your, your emotion in that situation rather than fighting back? Because I'm your dad, and I'm withholding about $10,000, yeah. and you want I, that postdoctoral work yes, done and, yes. and all of that. I am. Uh, I keep it a game faced, and okay. I'm talking to myself. You're and talking I'm to yourself. I'm saying, just stay calm. What's the truth? What's the truth? Focus on it. Just mm. say that one statement, and I will process later. You know, if there's other stuff that comes up, I can deal with it later. But in my communication here, mm-hmm. I need to stay focused, and so I'm telling myself that. So these are the self-talk that you were referring to earlier. Uh, Yolanda, this ability to talk to yourself even in the midst of that. Could you do self-talk that, hey, I, as your dad, you you know that I care because I have so much emotion around it, even though I'm putting you down and trying to... Even in that story, I'm thinking any dad that's going to spend that much amount of money on their daughter, they obviously care, Mm -hmm. even if there's other drama that's getting involved in the relationship, Mm -hmm. that, you know, that's... She, she doesn't deserve that. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. And mm-hmm. she should respect however much she can, uh, the good that he does have, if that's that's the type of relationship. Uh, I think sometimes when somebody's been hurt, it's easy to go back later, and, and I could easily reverse that on him and say, yeah, you need to pay for my school and everything else because of all the years you were such a terrible dad. I deserve everything from you. Mm-hmm. And you're going to, even if he's changed and he's healthier, you're going to throw it in his face again and again. That's also a common, uh, mm-hmm. you know, end mm-hmm. result. And that's not fair either. Right. I want to say nobody can make you mm. feel anything. You have complete and total responsibility to feel anything you want. And remember, feelings are not fact. They're feelings. And feelings are not faith. If someone, if you feel that someone is making you feel hostage, sometimes guilt is the thing that can drag you back. So maybe you need to tell yourself the truth, whatever the truth is. Accept God's forgiveness, make your peace, and then develop boundaries. There's an excellent book called Boundaries. Read it and apply it. Sometimes I think we give too much knowledge, too much information, and our clients or our friends don't grow because they don't apply it. So what you're listening to is good, but what are you going to do with it? So I think um, this situation, for you to understand that you may need to create and maintain boundaries, boundaries for yourself, and that you can also check yourself and see, why am I carrying this around? Uh, Do I really feel ashamed for doing that? Am I really guilty for that? And then processing it with God, processing it with yourself, the one person that it's involved with, and then letting it go. Remember, the stronghold is a place of security, Mm. security and safety. So you might ask yourself, how does this drama give me something I think I need? Do I feel a part of the family? Because even if they're bouncing me around like a ping pong ball, I'm still Mm -hmm. included. And I'm afraid if I have boundaries, they'll exclude me. Mm -hmm. A lot of truth telling for yourself. I think when you tell yourself the truth first and you also hear it from God through his word, there's nothing that can move you away from that. But until you come to that point, anything can just move you around like the wind. So I encourage you to be honest with your relationship with God. Once you hear from God, everything else pales. And it's like, ah, I can see that. I can hear that. I see your pain, but... I'm not responsible for feeling guilty, and I'm no longer hostage to anybody else's feelings. I belong to God. 
So that's actually, when we think about it, a stronghold is someplace I feel secure, but it locks me in. If we place our faith in the Lord, actually all of those strongholds will tend to diminish, correct? What I would like to go back to is the idea of feeling. I thought I heard you say that no one can tell me how to feel. Okay. No one can make me feel. Okay, make me feel. Excuse me. They can me. tell you to feel just about anything. They could, t- yes. But let's go back to that for just, let's unlayer that for a moment. I have a lot of people that would say, well, I'd like to say that no one can make me feel a certain way. Yet, when I talk with them, I feel a certain way. And I wouldn't, I, I would like not to feel that way. But just by being with them, I feel a certain way. So it feels like they're telling me how to feel, and I'm sick and tired of it. I don't want to feel that way, so I just I need not to be with them. What do you do with that? Have you ever had anyone say that in session? <laughs> okay. okay, and I go, I think I'm getting it. I, I think I'm getting it when they say that. So what do we do with that? I, what do we do you, with You know, that? something I always say when we're talking about this topic is it's not going to be easy Mm -hmm. because I think as a therapist, sometimes you say something, you know, if somebody says something, you're going to just think about what the meaning is and change it, and then you're going to feel better. And, you know, it is a formula that that works, but it's not easy. So I always tell people it's going to be difficult. It's going to take a lot of practice. Mm -hmm. And at first, there's the tiniest fraction of a second between when something's happening outside and when your brain starts working to interpret it or to make a conclusion about it mm-hmm. and then your feelings are going to respond if you know some some a group of people are laughing and you come in they stop laughing you could think are they making fun of me mm-hmm. you can think you know what's happening is there a joke however you interpret that situation mm-hmm. it's going to affect your emotions and so at first it it feels like there's no control it feels like there's no time that instantly you feel a certain way but if you become aware if you start practicing that every single time there's an event or a interaction with a person mm-hmm. and you start thinking about your thoughts. What's happening here? Why am I feeling this way? Am I thinking that, you know, I, I, I am a failure when they're talking. It's making me feel like a failure. Mm -hmm. You start analyzing it. That gap grows. You practice it and it's stretched out and it's going to be easier and easier, but it takes a long time of practice. So I set people up to not think it's going to be quick, but it's, it works. Yeah. You're speaking to that. That's what I think what you were saying, Yolanda, Mm -hmm. and that, um, it's actually a discipline practice of the way that we think about not only ourselves but others. And actually the best thinking will come from the Lord. Absolutely. When Paul said to the church, you know, to Corinth, you know, I'm able to comfort you with the comfort with which I've been comforted, he got it. He knew that he would have the mind of Christ coming through him to know how to think about himself and others, and I think that's what you're referring to. This this ties this next question ties directly into what we're talking about, I believe. How do you help someone? This is a question from the audience. How do you help someone, say a son or a daughter, understand that their self talk is destroying them? Okay, so it sounds like there's someone in the audience that has a son or daughter, and their self talk. The the son or daughter, the the self-talk is destroying them. So it's sort of what you were talking about. Like if I walked into a room and people were laughing, if I had very positive self-talk, it might be thinking, wow, they must have a good joke. I need to go over and see what the joke is. Something's funny. If I have really negative thought, I'll think they're laughing about me. How do I look? What's wrong with me? And try to figure that out. That would be kind of a very negative self-talk. That's a very simple illustration, but how would you respond to this? How do you help someone, a son or daughter, understand that their self-talk is destroying them? First thing that comes to my mind is, does your son or daughter trust you to tell them the truth? Hmm. Good question. Because without trust, your words don't, don't carry the weight that, that you want them to carry, the significance. So I would say build the trust that you're not going to say something to your child, your adolescent, um, that they'll say, oh, mom, you're always telling me that. Because without that trust for them to be able to know that you wouldn't say it if you didn't mean it, um, I think you just need to wait until that trust is there and it's evident. What are some, can I just, what are some basic ways to do that? Would that, number one, be listening to them empathetically, 
kind of mm-hmm. empathic listening, which means listening without critiquing, try to not to judge. So that would be one way to build that trust. Is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. That you first build that trust with the child? Mm-hmm. Every adolescent is different. They all have different personality traits. They all react differently. So I guess it would depend on how well you know your child. Mm-hmm. And um, if you're going to speak the truth, you need to make sure that you're speaking the truth to your child in love, actually to anyone yes. uh, in love, um, so that you, your words have weight that um, you can ask God, give me the words to say to my child that will make a difference. Mm-hmm. Make, put in a seed of hope. Put in a seed of, of self-worth um, so that it's not just all you. You know, sometimes I think, again, I, I think we try to protect our children. We're mm-hmm. trying to save them. I mean, there was only one Savior the last time I checked, but there could be others. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Um, <laughs> so anyway, they're, they're not real Saviors. So I, I think these are growing pains for our children as well as for us. And telling ourselves the truth is going to be confronting our faith with, with God. Mm-hmm. Where is he in all of this, and what is it I can do? Um, and if you're not impatient with your adolescent growing pain to figure it out himself and be there for him, if you're not impatient, if you don't want it right right now today or by Saturday at least for the family picnic, if you're not in a hurry, you'll need to grow with that process with him and telling him the truth. And there's a lot of ways to tell him the truth or her the truth. But mm-hmm. without trust, um, it's just not going to, I don't think it's going to be heard the way that you want it to be heard. So I think that trust, if I'm hearing correctly, is built on the transparency we show to that child of our relationship with the Lord. If there's transparency, they can see the transparency with which we communicate and listen with what the Lord is saying, then that will build trust. I think all trust goes back to how we're healthily connected with the Lord. That's what I'm, I'm hearing that. So, sure. In, in, in what Yolanda was saying, I think also, you know, check your own self-talk because mm. the most powerful way we teach is modeling. Yeah. So we all have turned into our parents, and when we realize, you know, the moment we said something, ah, how did this happen? Yes. Well, we are doing that also, and, and in working with clients, sometimes it's easier for them to get healthy when they recognize that this is what they're passing on to their children. If they can conquer it, they pass on that ability to conquer it to their children because mm-hmm. modeling is so powerful. Mm-hmm. And the relationship with God that we have, as we model it, that no matter what decisions they make right now, they will likely come back to modeling that relationship we have with Mm -hmm. God. So I think that's powerful is to see how are we doing with our own Mm self-talk and how is that transferring to our, to our child or adolescent. Yeah. I had, I had this week uh, parents, they came in and we were working on them as a couple, but then they referred to their, their child, their, their two children are biting each other. It's a very common thing, you know, biting, and they've tried everything to stop this. How do we stop this time in, time out, uh, a, a different discipline, holding things. And then I, I, in the middle of it, I said, well, now, when, when they bite, when, and I name the child, when this child bites the other child, what happens to you? And, of course, if I were the parent, I'd be upset. We, you know, you don't want your child to be biting another child or another person even. And so I've become very upset. And I said, well, then what do you think the child did? What, what did the child experience? And then we began a whole discussion on how potentially, we don't know yet, that that reactivity, which could be more of a response, the modeling, may have perpetuated the biting with the children. Uh, both of them are biting each other and um, tackling each other. And so it would be very interesting to see um, how that modeling changes. And it goes back to kind of self-regulating. How am I self-regulating in that, in that mm-hmm. process? So what a, what a powerful question. Anything else you were overthinking about this? I was thinking, um, I, I hope I'm not setting up anyone to think, oh, the truth is going to just be so fluffy and so <laughs> cuddly, and I just need more truth today. <laughs> the truth can be hard truth, especially if it means that 
you really have a problem and you need to deal with it or you might die. The truth that comes from God is always going to give you an insight that you didn't have before mm. about you, about God. But the truth is something that not everyone wants and not everyone pursues. I want mm. to encourage you that for you to be free, free emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, and free in your body, it's worth everything you can do to pursue it. It's worth risking everything not to live in a lie. And <clears throat> one thought I just remembered is that we create our own misbeliefs when trouble happens. Like, I should have known better. How could this have happened? But, but also beware when other people, well-intentioned people, put lies on top of you. Mm. And then you eat them up and ask for seconds. Mm. Don't do that. Really, really don't do that. It may be unintentioned. They may love you. They may be your best friend. But be very wary when beliefs are misbeliefs, lies are placed on you. Uh, and they could come from anywhere. So it causes you to realize that this is spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. Our weapons are not carnal or physical, mm -hmm. but they are strong and mighty and pulling down strongholds in God. So I just want you to know that if you stand up and you say, whatever it takes, I want to know the truth about me and I want to know the truth about this situation. And if I have to change, well, that's what I'm going to do. Good for you. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point of tonight, that you not fear truth, even if it means you're going to be uncomfortable for a while. You're not going to like it, but you're going to be free because you're not going to be deceived anymore. Wow. So... Truth is taking huge risk, isn't it, to really seek out the truth. This last question this evening ties right into that, where the person is asking, when Paul was writing to the church at Rome, you know, and he said, the things I, I want to do, I, I, I don't end up doing, the things I don't want to do, I, I, you know, that, that, that Scripture. And the question is, how do you break this vicious cycle? So, the Scripture is saying there is truth, and um, asking you to do that and to behave and think, and yet we tend to do something else. That, and I know there's a whole theological issue surrounding this, but if we can make it very practical in the sense, uh, the person is asking, how do you break this vicious cycle? So again, it's asking from a different vantage point, how do I discover the truth and then make sure that I do it and not end up doing something else? Maybe a stronghold like we were talking about before. Can we kind of wrap it all up around this particular scripture and question? I'm just, it may be a little bit of theology, but uh, because well, it's powerful, and that's yes. the idea that we have, you know, a sin nature yes. and the Holy Spirit within us, and that they battle, and that's the whole point of that passage. Mm -hmm. But something that stood out to me uh, that relates with truth, that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. So the two natures in us are at opposite not a little bit of one and a little of the other. If we are walking in the Holy Spirit, it's 100%. If yeah. the sin nature sneaks in, it's 100%. So that was powerful in my mind to recognize that we need truth 100%, and that is found in Scripture. Mm -hmm. So I really do believe that uh, knowing the Word of God and knowing truth from Scripture will help us in all of these situations. Wh who are we? What's our identity? Well, Christ in Christ, we know what it is. And what are we able to make mistakes and be forgiven? We know the answer. The true answers to the deep questions are in Scripture, mm -hmm. and so knowing the Word of God is very powerful. So it's not necessarily uh, psychological, but it is something that I think is the true answer to that question. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if the question is asking, how can I break this cycle so that I'm always truthful and I never believe a lie? Because that's impossible. If you're asking for perfection, it will never happen. And I would say, when I came to ask some similar question to this, um, I felt like God was asking me, are you afraid to trust me? That no matter where you find yourself off of truth, that I can bring you back? If you're not afraid to learn from mistakes, failures, pain, trauma, crisis, hurts, disappointments, 
If you're not afraid to trust God, then you can count it all joy, no matter what happens, no matter what cycle you're in. Um, the idea is for you to be able to be, like Paul was saying, um, I run the race mm -hmm. uh, for the joy set before me. And you just want to finish strong. You don't want to finish perfect. You just want to finish strong. And you don't want to finish a know-it-all. Please. <laughs> you just want to know who God is and that you belong to him. But in terms of breaking a cycle, you will have cycles that are more significant in life than others, like such as a cycle of addiction, which is robbing, stealing, killing, destroying your life. Mm -hmm. You will need to break that cycle and understand that at any time in life, any point in the continuum of life, you can feel, you can be deceived, you can be addicted to anything at any time. But the point is, the truth is, you know where to go. You know who can help you. That is not something to be afraid of. So breaking a cycle, grow through that. Grow through that. Understand that. And I hope that when you break the cycle and you tell yourself the truth, you have a lot of compassion for yourself and that you love yourself. And you go, oh, gosh, I didn't know that. And that you hear God whisper to you and say, I know you didn't know that. <laughs> Now I'm telling you, and it's okay. It's okay. That's beautifully said. I think both of you, if I can even add a little piece, if I may, the, the more that we turn toward uh, the Lord, uh, we, we call this uh, the gift of sanctification, and that is a heart turned toward God. Actually, the more we turn toward Him, the more we're humbled and have a, uh, a softened heart to learn, and the less we become boisterous or pontificate about ourselves because we see that He's the one that's giving the truth. You know, if we walk in the light as He's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us and gives us a heart that turns toward, toward the Lord. So that's the beauty of when we turn toward the Lord, we are going to hear more truth <laughs> because we're going to be trusting in the right truth, which is what we've been talking about. So I, I always say this as a psychotherapist is that um, the best training I had in psychotherapy was actually my Bible training <laughs> because I'm always leaning toward the truth, the real truth. And the, the science world is remarkable in what it helps us to understand of the truth, but we always point back to the truth because that's what will set us free. And uh, well, I, would you join me this evening in, in thanking our, our marvelous panel and for presenting this evening? Thank you so much. And I would like to mention that our next My Therapist Says is going to be with Dr. Julie Hayden presenting. She will be our guest, um, and that is October 6th. So I hope that uh, you will uh, join. If, you, if you'll notice her background, even though she's a clinical psychologist, that her background has strength in Bible. In fact, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I could be in error, that your undergrad was in Bible. Yep. Yes, that comes through all the time. I, I love when I hear you talking about the Bible and then clinical issues. But that is going to, you can see that, That'll be October 6th, and it will be live streamed as well. And then I might mention also that Yolanda is presenting Telling Yourself the Truth, a five-week workshop for men. And it starts here in September the 23rd. And there are some uh, handouts in the very back if you have someone or yourself would like to participate in that. She will be leading the group herself. So again, thank you for For being here tonight, I'm very proud of the two of you, and thank you for joining us and presenting a very, very important topic uh, about uh, uh, the truth. I think as a parent, I, I have this deep, deep desire that my kids would know the truth. If they knew the truth, and if they know the truth, then maybe I've done my work as a parent. Not that I deliver the truth. I hope I model it. I hope we talk about it. And we're talking about the truth that comes from the Lord, not from me. But I hope I'm a conduit through which they see the truth and hear the truth. I think that's the desire of probably every uh, parent or grandparent or, or having an adopted child as well. So, well, let's have a word of prayer. And thank you again for coming out this evening on a Tuesday evening. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the truth that does set us free. That's not just a slogan 
or a cute little statement. Your truth sets us free from our own negative self-talk. That's really what the devil would like to do, is to come in and self-defeat. If he could get us just to self-defeat, negative talk, incorrect self-talk, and destroy from within, he's done his work. We're, thank you, we're thankful, excuse me, that, Father, you never talk down to us. You're never in a, a moment of condescension sending verbiage and or indirect kind of uh, horrible words toward us, you, you see us with agape love. That's unending love. We, we couldn't do anything to destroy your love for us. That's just remarkable love. We, I can't get my arms around it, and yet I'm so thankful for it. So thank you for speaking truth here tonight. And we as we prayed before this session tonight, Father, would you please help any word that was shared or thought that doesn't speak of your truth, that somehow would just be dismissed as we leave. Yet, Father, as you have spoken truth and used these moments, and the Holy Spirit in particular, who has spoken to so many tonight, if not all of us, obviously, yet there might be some of us unable to hear your truth because you're always speaking truth to us in tremendous love. Would if there's though, there are those words, Father, may they just become indelibly placed within us. We would inculcate them, assimilate them, download them into our lives. Your truth that would set us free as we leave here tonight. We're thankful, most importantly, for your presence and your love and grace. We give you praise and we thank you for all truth comes from you. And we're so grateful and we will be eternally grateful um, through, through eternity. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again so much for coming. God bless you. I hope that it's a great evening for you.